Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Katja Achermann. I am a member of the Executive Committee of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, or CPP. And on behalf of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, I would like to warmly welcome you all to this last CPP Speaker Series event of this term this afternoon. By way of brief background, the CPP is now in its 11th year. It is a research program run out of the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. What we do is to partner faculty members and graduate research students with leading barristers chambers, charities and NGOs to produce targeted research on issues of contemporary social significance. Alongside that work, we also provide a network here in Cambridge for students and faculty members with an interest in pro bono work and human rights. To that end, we have started a regular speaker series last year and as I said, as our last speaker for this term, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Pablo Gonzalez Dominguez, who will be speaking on access to justice before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Dr. Pablo Gonzalez Dominguez is a staff attorney at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He has received his JSD in international human rights law from the University of Notre Dame. He also holds an LLM in International Legal Studies from Georgetown University, as well as an LLB from the Pan American University in Mexico. He has been a visiting scholar at the Legal Research Institute at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and an, and an adjunct professor at several universities and institutions across um, Central and South America in Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador and Costa Rica. He is the author of the book, The Doctrine of Conventionality Control Between Uniformity and Legal Pluralism in the Inter-American Human Rights System, published by Intersensia. We are extremely grateful to have Pablo, at least virtually here in Cambridge with us this afternoon. Pablo will be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes, followed by a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session. Please do post any questions you may have for Pablo in the Q&A section of Zoom. We also have Alex Allen Franks on the panel um, this afternoon. She is also a member of the CPP um, Executive Committee and will be assisting with questions. Welcome, Pablo. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Cambridge Pro Bono Project um, for this invitation to talk about the value of pro bono work in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, just a little bit of background, and just as Katja just mentioned, I studied my first law degree in Mexico, and I am currently working at, at, as a staff attorney at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So the focus of this talk will be mainly from uh, my perspective as practitioner in the court, and also my experience dealing with human rights questions in, in, in Latin America. Um, I'm going to divide this presentation in, in two parts. First, I would like to talk briefly about some basic historical, institutional, and procedural aspects of the Inter-American Court that I think um, are relevant for our topic. And then I will focus on how the pro bono work takes place before the court and its importance for the proper representation of the victims in the Inter-American system and for the better reasoning of the court's uh, decisions. And finally, I will make some, uh, some concluding remarks so we can talk about these or other related topics in the Q&A um, session. So thanks again uh, for the invitation. Um, so about institutional aspects, I think it's important to remind that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is an autonomous legal institution created by, by virtue of the entry into force of the American Convention of Human Rights, whose main objective is to comprise all cases concerning the interpretation and application of the American Convention and other treaties of similar nature in the Inter-American system. Along with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the court constitutes uh, one of the two main organs of supervision in the Inter-American human rights system. It is also, as you know, one of the three regional um, tribunals around the world together with the European Court of Human Rights and the African Court of Human Rights. It is also, and we can categorize it like this, as uh, one of the international mechanisms of protection of human rights, which coexists with the mechanisms for controlling the compliance of human rights treaties at the universal level, especially through the UN bodies of supervision. Um, the jurisdiction of the court is deployed in three instances. We can again categorize this in, in, in three different aspects where the jurisdiction is manifested. First, the contentious jurisdiction. This might be the most important and, and, and the one that people know the better. 
that allows the court to decide on individual cases and interstate cases involving human rights violations and to rule if a state is internationally responsible for those violations or their reparations and after the decision is, taking, is taken to supervise the compliance with its judgments. The second is the advisory jurisdiction that allows the court to clarify the object, purpose, and meaning of international human rights law on the compatibility or the compatibility between domestic law and treaties concerning the protection of human rights. And what we may call the preventive jurisdiction by which the court has the power to order provisional measures in cases of extreme gravity and urgency to avoid irreparable damage to the persons. Um, and this is a direct quote of the American Convention. The court is an autonomous regional court, um, and yet uh, it is important, of course, it is not isolated from the actors and events that occur in the international arena. From an, inter from an institutional standpoint, the organization of American states and the states parties to the convention are the main formal actors with which the court deals and interacts on crucial questions. Uh, this is obvious because uh, the legal instruments that define the basic procedural and substantive aspects of the inter-American system emerge precisely from the agreement of states that takes place in the context of the Organization of American States and because the Inter-American Commission and the states are the main actors with legitimacy to activate the court's jurisdiction. For instance, it is just the commission, the one that can present a case before the court uh, and, and it's, there's no direct access and this, that is, that's clearly different from how it works in the European system of human rights. The court also depends on, of, on states either considered individually or as participants in the General Assembly of the OAS in matters as important as the appointment of the judgments, for instance, the approval of its budget, the consideration of the annual report, the appropriate substantiation of cases, and the procedure of compliance with its, judgment, uh, with its judgments. The Commission and the states, for instance, are parties, well, the Commission is, uh, and, the, and the state, they are parties during the procedure of the Inter-American Court. And of course, the state and the participation of the state is fundamental for the proper substantiation of the procedure, as well as obviously for the compliance of the judgments. So, so the states and the Organization for American States are the most important formal actors that participate and interact with the Inter-American Court. Now, notwithstanding the centrality of these two actors, the states and the different bodies of the OAS in institutional design and functioning of the Inter-American system, the court's work is highly influenced by other actors. These actors may, may have lesser formal importance, uh, for instance, the representatives of the victims before the court, since they are parties during the procedure, but obviously they are not main political actors in the political processes in the OAS, and yet they are, of course, parties in the procedure before the court, or other actors that have no formal importance during the procedures, for instance, academia or uh, governmental institutions that are not representing the state before the court. They are not formal actors, properly speaking, and yet these institutions, and we can say this, are fundamental for the success in the fulfillment of the court's mandate and in the access to justice for the victims. So this is a little bit of background of what, 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 I, what, what I actually want to tell you in, in this talk, that is to talk about the pro bono work. And among these actors, these other actors that are not formal actors, properly speaking, this is not the state, not state institutions, not the Organization of American States or its bodies, uh, civil society, especially NGOs, play a prominent role. One of the principal forms in which the NGO, NGOs contribute to, achieve, to achieve the goals of the inter-American system is precisely through the pro bono representation of the victims at the national level and then before the inter-American system. Uh, it is possible to say um, that without the support of NGOs, it will be almost impossible for the victims of human rights violations to pass through the process at the national level first and then go to the commission and then go to the court. I mean, this is a very long process and a complex one. Uh, and it would be almost impossible without this work involvement of, the, of NGOs in the representation of victims to actually um, uh, get all the way through the procedure. And here, I think it's relevant to remind some basic as aspects of the procedure before the inter-American system to, to know what, what I'm talking about and to highlight the importance of NGOs uh, throughout this process. The American Convention provides that a petition before the Inter-American Commission requires that, and here I quote Article 46 of the American Convention, the remedies under domestic law have been pursued and exhausted in accordance with generally recognized principles of international law. This is the typical manifestation of the subsidiary nature of 
uh, international mechanisms for protection of human rights. First, it is needed that the procedure at the domestic level is exhausted, and then a petition might be filled before the uh, international bodies of protection. Um, in practice, obviously, this means that the victims of human rights violations first need to seek for remedy at the national level, a condition that may require years before domestic courts issue a final judgment and the victim may present a petition before the Inter-American Commission. Once the commission receives the petition, it will decide on the admissibility. Um, it will ask for information to the state. It will proceed to verify the facts of the case, um, carry out the necessary investigations, and it may receive oral or written statements from the parties and will try to reach a friendly settlement on the matter. Is there no, if there is no friendly settlement before the commission, the, the commission would draw a report setting forth the facts and it's stating its conclusions as well as recommendations of the case. And if the, if the matter is not settled after the report, if the, if the state has the chance to actually uh, solve the problems that emerged and, and were identified by the commission, the commission may submit the case to the Inter-American Court. There is no direct access to the Inter-American Court, just as I mentioned, so it can only decide cases filled by the commission or states in accordance with the procedures set forth in the American Convention. The victim needs to pass through the process at the national level and the commission before reaching out for the court. And after the case is submitted to the court, the victims or the representatives start acting autonomously in the procedure and may submit a brief containing platings, motions, and evidence. That brief is then responded by the state. The court then may be called for a public hearing where the parties present oral arguments. So we have the possibility to cross-examine the witnesses um, and experts. The parties may submit their final written arguments after the hearing, after which the court will render the judgment on the preliminary objections, merits, reparations, and costs. And the parties have no right to appeal, but they can require uh, the modification of, of material er errors or present a request for interpretation. Um, um, this takes, I mean, they have a, a, a time of three months after the decision is taken to, to ask for this uh, request of interpretation. And once the court notifies the judgment to the parties, the procedure for monitoring compliance with the judgment begins. Um, the procedure is carried out, it's carried out by the court. I think this is important because this is also different than how it works in the European system of human rights. It's the court, the one that also supervises the compliance with its own judgments. And there is a procedure for this where uh, the states will uh, present observations on the compliance, then the, the, the representatives of the victims will have the chance to um, reply to those, to those observations made by the state, and then uh, the Inter-American Commission can intervene as well in this procedure. And the court will evaluate the information submitted by the parties in order to conclude if the orders, if the orders of the court in a judgment have been fully complied, and therefore if the case can be closed. Um, so considering this, and, and I'm just making this a very brief summary of how is the procedure before the Inter-American system, just to highlight how crucial is NGO representation for the access to justice of the victims. And this is uh, uh, for at least, in my opinion, for at least three reasons. The first one is that the procedures at the national and international level are long and complex. Uh, they could potentially last decades from the moment the violation occurred to the moment when a judgment by the Inter-American Court is rendered, rendered and even more time before the judgment of the court is fully complied. And here, just to mention some examples, uh, look, I was looking at the, at the five most recent judgments decided by the court. Uh, this is 2020. Um, and the procedure before the commission lasted for an average of 14 years before the case reached the court. Uh, 12 years in the first one, 11, 19 years, 11 years, and 18 years. Uh, in the court, the procedure lasts an average of two years before the judgment is rendered or from the moment where the petition, the, the case is submitted to the court by the commission to the moment the judgment is made by the court. And to this time, we have to add the length of the procedure at the national level. They have to exhaust the, all the local remedies that are relevant before presenting the petition and the time after the judgment is fully complied. So this is the time, where, the time that lasts the, the monitoring compliance um, procedure. Um, and, and so in practice, and this is not in all the cases, uh, they might pass decades before, but from the moment the violation occurred to the moment you have a compliance with the judgment. And, and here I'm talking just from personal experience, I have worked in cases uh, that the violations occurred, for instance, in 1989, and the decision was taken in 2017, or 
um, other than that occurred in 1982, and the decision was taken in 2020, and the two victims were already dead when the decision was taken. So, so this is obviously this is a, a much complex problem, uh, and we can talk about this later. But but here I just want to highlight the length of the procedure, and therefore the importance that you have NGOs working pro bono. Um, uh, in supporting these cases and carrying out these cases throughout all this time and throughout this procedure before, before the national level and then the commission and then the court. The second reason is that the procedures before the commission and the court have certain degree of specialization in procedural and substantive terms. So the victims need lawyers and other specialists for the proper conduction of their cases. And although it is true that legal representation may be provided by the court in case that this is needed through the appointment of an, what is called Inter-American Public Defender. In the majority of cases, the representation is made by lawyers that work for NGOs or legal clinics that accompany, accompany the victims at the national level and then the international level. And here, I think we need to consider, and this is very important, the cost associated that, to consider that the, cost, the costs associated with a case are extensive. They include the travel costs that arise in every case, the activities related with the litigation, especially related to the work of the lawyers and the production of evidence. Sometimes the victims and the victims' relative have, relatives have to be identified and contacted, and experts sometimes need to produce relevant evidence before the court and the commission. And although the legal system fund of the Inter-American Court might cover some of these expenses and the payment of costs and expenses might be ordered in the judgment, the length of the procedure make crucial the support of organizations throughout the process. And again, and even when there are some mechanisms that help the victims to, uh, to, 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 to finance their own, their own cases, the majority, the, burden, the majority of the burden of these costs will, will be passed to the victims and therefore to the angels that are representing these victims. Um, and the third aspect, and, and, and perhaps the most relevant for this reflection, and is obviously connected with the previous ones, the, the length of the procedure, and the, and the necessity to have a, a proper representation throughout the procedure um, is that the victims of the cases brought to the court are often persons that do not have access to adequate legal services within the respective states and or that belong to the most vulnerable groups of, in their societies. And therefore, without the support of NGOs or individuals acting pro bono, their possibilities to get adequate legal representation, at least one needed to have real access to justice at the international level will be severely affected. And I think this is crucial. I mean, uh, 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 the, the, the profile of the, of the victims and the, and, and the groups um, of victims before the inter-American system uh, is people that most of the times are particularly vulnerable. And, and they would not have either the financial resources or even the knowledge that they can uh, uh, have access to justice at the national level and the international level. So the work of NGOs is uh, fundamental from this, um, from this perspective. And we could see many cases closely and uh, in the inter-American system, and we will be able to see this pattern of persons that belong to vulnerable groups, but have representations by NGOs and therefore have successful litigations before the inter-American system. A good recent example of this is the case of the employees of the firework factory of Santa, San Antonio de Jesus versus Brazil. This was a case decided in 2020. In this case, and in my opinion, one of the most important decisions of the court in 2020, the victims were 66 persons, most of them Afro-descended women, including 23 children, which either died or were injured in an explosion that occurred in a fireworks factory that lacked the adequate conditions of safety required by both national legislation and international standards. The victims of this case lived in poverty and lacked access to formal education, so the few labor opportunities that they had in their country were precisely in manufacture of the fireworks, an activity with a high and extremely dangerous degree of informality and with a lack of adequate conditions of safety. Uh, the representatives of the case of the victims were four NGOs and uh, three individuals working together in the case. And here, here, here what I want to say is, and the reflection is to point out the importance of the work of local actors that have the intellectual and material resources to be able to conduct a case all the way from the moment the violation occurred at the, at the domestic level to the final decision of the court. And this is a very complex procedure because it has two very clear differentiated stages. Uh, what is happening at the national level and that requires certain expertise 
and therefore the involvement of local actors. And then you have the litigation at the inter-American level, and then you will need um, another type of expertise, other type of lawyers that carry out the procedure all the way through the final decision of the court and the compliance of these judgments. Um, so in the case, in the case of um, Fabrica, um, sorry, the, the firework factory, um, almost 17 years passed from the moment of the petition before the commission was presented to the submission of the case to the court. So again, without the work of these NGOs, it would have been almost impossible for the victims and the relatives of the victims to get a final judgment and therefore to have the reparation that comes with the decision of the court. Another facet of uh, the pro bono work that I think it's important to mention in this presentation and are the contributions made by NGOs, universities, institutes, and individuals acting in their private capacity as what we may call friends of the court. Um, these contributions take different forms, but usually they contain information that helps having a better understanding of the factual and legal questions presented before the court, or that helps to understand the historical or social context where these cases uh, took place. Uh, this is the, 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 these are the amicus curiae. I mean, basically these are the, 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 the people that send or institutions that send information to the court. They send briefs to the court making legal analysis. Formally, the possibility of third parties to participate in the procedures by presenting information is regulated by the rules of procedure of the court, which allows persons or institutions to act as amicus curiae and submit a brief with recent arguments regarding the facts contained in the presentation of a case or legal considerations of the subject matter of the pr procedure. This is a possibility opened in contentious procedure and in the stage of monetary compliance uh, with the judgment. And also, and this, is, this goes uh, with uh, the amicus curiae, the rules of procedure allow for any interested party to submit a written opinion, what we refer to as observations, on the issues covered by a request of an advisory opinion. So, so we had two different types of, uh, of, of contributions. One are the amicus curiae, and they, they work for um, uh, everything that happens in the contentious procedures. And, you have, and we have the observations that are the briefs that can be sent um, as contributions for the solution of the questions presented in the, in the, in the procedure of the advisory opinions. Um, so th these are two different, uh, two different um, uh, mechanisms or tools, but they both are third parties contributing to the decisions of the court uh, as, as friends of the court, we may, we may say. Um, and here in this regard, I would like to refer to the case of Fernandez Prieto and Tumbeiro versus Argentina. This is a case decided in 2020, the case refers to the violation of the right to personal liberty because of the illegal and arbitrary detention of the victims of the case. One of the elements presented to the court um, by the commission and by the representatives was that these detentions occurred in a context where the police indiscriminately detained persons in Argentina based on the intuition of the, office, of, of the officers about the commission of a crime, but by doing this, they were acting outside of the conditions stated by the code of criminal procedure that authorized the police to detain a person without a warrant. Um, so among the information provided to understand this context, this context of, uh, of detentions made by the police just based on, the, on, on their intuition uh, and not on um, at least more objective evidence that a, com a commission of a crime might have occurred. Um, was uh, that of local NGOs that have studied for decades the phenomenon of arbitrary detentions in Argentina during the 1990s based on social and, raci and racial profiles. Um, so this is the type of information that local organizations are much better located to provide bef before the court because they have studied for longer time and have expertise on the phenomenon that the, that the case reflects and that the case has presented before the court. Um, and for that reason, this information can be extremely helpful to understand the case of, at, at hand. Of course, the basis for the analysis, for the legal analysis of the facts of a case is based on the facts presented by the Inter-American Commission in their final report, by the evidence that is presented by the commission, by the state representatives, by the, by the representatives of the victims. I mean, that, that would be the core of the analysis, the legal analysis of the case. But the information that is provided, for instance, like in the case of Fernandez Prieto and Tombeiro, uh, from third parties, help the court to contextualize better that information that is provided 
by the parties in the procedure. I mean, they are, there's not going to be a legal analysis, properly speaking, on that, but it will help the legal analysis made by the court, for instance, in this case, in factual questions. Um, and equally important, so this will be one aspect of the value of the information provided in amicus curiae. It helps to contextualize the facts of the case um, based on historical, social, or uh, um, uh, basically historical, social, or, or, or economic conditions that surround the case. I mean, it helps the court to understand better these type of aspects. Um, and equally important is the information provided by, th by third parties for interpretative purposes. That will be another aspect, another utility that has the information provided by amicus curiae. The amicus curiae and the observations presented to the court often serve as relevant inputs to answer the legal questions presented by a case. This information sometimes comes from institutions or individuals with a particular expertise on specific areas that have not been fully explored by the jurisprudence of the court. So this allows a better reasoning on the case at hand. The participation by experts as third parties is a way for the court to develop new and better arguments to have information on how a particular question has been solved in other jurisdictions or to have a better theoretical analysis on the issues at hand. And I selected these three aspects because I really believe that on the one hand we have the, the amicus curiae as a way to understand better the facts of the case or the conditions that surround the facts that are relevant, legally relevant to decide the case. But they also have other purposes. For instance, they provide uh, legal arguments uh, in terms of how to solve a particular question, especially novel questions that are presented before the court. Uh, they also help, and this is also extremely useful, uh, and I'm talking here also from, from the practice, uh, that it provides comparative analysis. I mean, the, 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 uh, sometimes it's just even a matter of time. I mean, it's, it, when you have people that is um, uh, presenting studies of what's happening in their countries uh, about a particular question, I mean, when you put all this information together, it helps to have a better understanding of what's going on in Latin America or or in other, in other latitudes. And also, uh, they also provide sometimes information that we may call more theoretical. Um, uh, uh, this is especially relevant in novel questions. I'm thinking about questions of, of gender identity, for instance. I mean, where we, we have new legal theories or, 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 or theoretical information that is relevant to understand that particular question or uh, questions about the environment and the need to protect the environment. These are, these are also not just legal questions, they all come uh, with uh, a, a theory behind that is also relevant to understand better. And it helps the work of the court to have this type of knowledge that comes from institutions that have expertise on those particular areas or people that have studied this um, for a while. And, and, and again, that have expertise uh, in theoretical or, or legal um, aspects. And here, for instance, I would like to mention the case of uh, Guzmán Alvaracín and others versus Ecuador. This is a case decided in 2020. And the court referred here to several amicus curiae to interpret the extent of the right to education recognized by Article 13 of the Ad Additional Protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights in the area of economic, social, and cultural rights, or what is called uh, like the Protocol of San Salvador. That's the short name of the, this additional protocol. In particular, the court considered that the states had the obligation to take actions for the prevention of human rights violations during the educational process. Uh, in that regard, states must take, and this is the court, um, you know, the, the criteria of the court, the states must take into, con into consideration the specificities that come with gender and sexual violence against women. And, and here I would like to highlight that the O'Neill Institute of National and Global Health Law, among other institutions, pointed out through their amicus curiae um, the legal reasoning that helped to support the construction of this obligation in the court's analysis and the negative con consequences in the well-being of individuals which comes with sexual violence during the education process. Um, the case of Guzman Alvarazin involved the responsibility of the state for the commission of acts of sexual violence of a vice dean. This was one of the principles, we may say, of a public school against an adolescent student. So again, here, the, the, the type of information that comes from Amicus Curiae helps to, 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 to make a better uh, assessment and analysis of the legal questions that are presented in the case. Um, it is possible to see this type of participation uh, of third parties in the different procedures before the court, but mostly in advisory opinions. The, the two previous cases that I, that I mentioned were uh, contentious cases, the case of Fernandez Pereton Tumbeiro versus Argentina, the case of 
um, Guzmán Alvaracín versus um, Ecuador and the case of the fire, firework factory. But the, the, you, we can see that this participation of third parties is particularly um, uh, important in at least in terms of the amount of participation that exists in, uh, in the procedures um, before the Inter-American Court in the advisory procedure before the Inter-American Court. Um, that by definition presents legal challenges that have an abstract nature and that are of interest for human rights in the region. Just to mention an example of how much participation of third parties exists during the advisory procedures, in the last three advisory opinions decided by the court, an average of 67 observations have been presented mostly by members of civil society. If we see this uh, in comparison with contentious uh, cases, we'll see it may be five, four, three, seven uh, amicus curiae, but in the case of advisory opinions, we see this uh, huge participation from uh, different actors as that send what we call observations that are briefs with, um, uh, with, with comments to the questions presented before the court. Um, these advisory opinions have tackled uh, issues in a variety of topics that include, for instance, the effects of the denunciation of the American Convention on Human Rights in the Obligations of the States, the institution of asylum as a human right or equality and non-discrimination regarding gender identity. The last two are both uh, pressing questions of human rights in the region. They are relevant not just uh, for the case, but for the, for the questions presented before the court, but they are relevant in general. We're discussing this, this type of questions in Latin America. And the first question is a classical one of public international law. So the expertise and, 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 and the observations that are sent by experts on these areas are obviously especially relevant for the work of the court. Uh, and the type of institutions that send their observations during the advisory proceedings are often specialized in the subject matter of the questions presented to the court, making possible for the tribunal to have access to the expertise of these institutions for the elaboration of an advisory opinion. And again, just as an example, I would like to use the advisory opinion 23 on the environment on human rights that was decided in 2017. And here, the court examined and took into account 52 observations. These observations, including those of organizations such as the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, the International Center for Comparative and Environmental Law, the Conservation Clinic and Costa Rica Program of Sustainable Development, Law, Policy, and Professional Practice at the University of Florida, the Environmental Law and Alliance Worldwide, among others. I mean, just, just selected the ones that are clearly focused on environmental issues. Um, the advisory opinion, although presented by the state or the Inter-American Commission, this uh, Inter-American Commission and other bodies in the OAS are the only ones that have legitimacy to present uh, uh, an advisory request before the court. But um, even when this is the case, the, 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 the advisory opinion is constructed in, in, in part by the inputs presented by civil society and that is expressed in their observations before the court. I, and I think this is, I would like to make just a, a brief re reflection about this. I think this is one of the reasons why the advisory opinions and perhaps the cases also, so the contagious cases before the court reflect so much the position of civil society in particular questions. I mean, this, this type of participation allows for the court to see what's going on beyond what happens in the states or the position of the states or the position of the organs of the, of the, of the OAS. Uh, civil society can participate, the court can see these, questions, these, these inputs and these arguments and reasonings presented by third parties, by civil society, and take them into consideration while uh, drafting the decisions and especially the advisory opinions. So uh, this perhaps is one of the, one of the, um, uh, of the reasons why the court is in part uh, all kind of in tune with what's happening in civil society and what's happening by the experts that are, have been studying the questions presented before the court um, for a while. And, and here, again, I would like to mention that the, the information provided by third parties is especially relevant if we consider that the court has historically interpreted the American Convention from what has been referred to as, and I hear a quote, the best, the best perspective for the protection of the individual. Um, the court has sustained constant, consistently that the interpretation of the American Convention is partly based on Article 29 of the American Convention, which serves as the hermeneutical basis for a teleological, te teleological approach and for the acceptance of the pro persona principle as a fundamental principle of interpretation of rights. So the information that comes from third parties via amicus curiae or observations in the, in the, 
uh, advisory procedure precisely serves to have a better understanding of the content of rights seen from the perspective of civil society. Again, this is a, an, a, an excellent opportunity for the court to observe actually what are the positions that different actors outside of the OAS and the states have regarding human rights questions that are relevant for the court. And in this framework of participation of civil society in the work of the court, I would like to mention the collaboration that the court has with academic institutions in several instances. Uh, the court has agreements with several institutions for the purposes of collaboration, specifically to allow the exchange of information, professional research visits to the courts, publications, etc. One of the types of collaborations that exists is the elaboration of research projects with universities in topics that are relevant for the court. These are very focused type of research projects that provide relevant information and legal analysis take advantage from the expertise of the institutions with which the project is taking place. And the court actually has one of these projects with uh, the Cambridge Perennial Projects since, since several years. Uh, and in our experience, uh, these research provided by the CPB have been extremely relevant as it constitutes solid anal legal analysis on questions based on public international law and uh, comparative law. And here we'd like to say that the studies at Cambridge, at least, of course, this is my sense, uh, that's a personal opinion, are in a very privileged position to provide this type of information and analysis for the court and to strengthen the work of the court. Why? Well, partly because um, in the end, uh, the court is located in San Jose. We are in uh, Latin America. The, the, most of the information that comes to the court will be uh, naturally that from our countries. And the type of collaborations with institutions like Cambridge helps to broaden that, 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 that scope of, of, of analysis either to go to other international institutions and to have more information about what's going on in other international institutions, or also to have a broader comparative analysis of what's happening in the world regarding the, 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 the questions that are relevant for the court in several instances. Uh, and, and I think this helps the court in particular to have a more cosmopolitan um, view of the protection of human rights in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, the, in its work in the different capacity where it exercise its jurisdiction. So, so this, type of, this type of work is relevant from that perspective. I mean, it, it is uh, expertise from a particular uh, institution and its work that in the end provides inputs for the court and to, to, to do uh, the work here um, uh, better. Um, so here I would like to just highlight some ideas of what I have been saying uh, in, this, in these minutes. Um, uh, and first, uh, just to, 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 to say again that the participation of civil society through the pro bono representation is fundamental for the access to justice of the victims of human rights violations for at least three reasons. The length of the procedures, the specialization required in the litigation and the costs that come with litigation, both at the national level and at the level of the inter-American system, uh, the, and the vulnerable conditions of most of the victims in the inter-American system. Uh, I think I'm not exaggerating that without the support of NGOs and legal clinics, it would be almost impossible to have access to justice in the inter-American system for the majority of uh, victims uh, that occur. Um, and I, actually, I would, I would say that the success of uh, the inter-American human rights system is deeply connected with the work that has been done throughout the decades by these institutions, by NGOs, by legal clinics, by universities that have helped uh, and supported the victims of human rights violations throughout the process uh, at the national level and at the international level. Second, um, the, the pro bono participation of civil society before the court is also manifested by sending amicus curiae obser or observations in the procedures followed before the court. And here, again, the information provided by third parties helps to tackle factual or legal questions or to have a better understanding of the social, historical, or political conditions where these violations took place. Uh, it also helps to have a better interpretation from the best perspective for the protection of human rights since seen from the lenses of civil society. Here again, uh, the basis for the decision of the case will be the, the facts presented by the commission, the evidence that is provided by the former parties in the procedure, but this type of information helps to contextualize um, factual questions before the court and also to provide more relevant information to make an analysis of these facts from the basis of um, international law or comparative law. And in that re regard, uh, I, uh, it is also relevant to mention the collaboration of the court with academic institutions for the exchange of information and for the development, developing of focused research projects like the one that the court has 
with the Cambridge Pro Bono project. These, these projects and the reports produced by them, I think, are part of uh, the inputs provided by civil society um, that are fundamental for the, again, the proper interpretation uh, of, uh, of, of the provisions of the convention and in general to make a better assessments of the questions at hand before the court. Um, well, uh, Katja, this is everything that I have for you. Uh, thank you very much.